From the University of Chicago, this is Big Brains, a podcast about pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. I'm your host, Paul Rand. In the last few weeks, our country has been rocked by nationwide protests following the killing of George Floyd and many other African Americans at the hands of police. This show is dedicated to presenting essential research from the University of Chicago that analyzes the underlying and overt historical racial injustices that have driven the protests. We're going to do something just a little different for this episode. We're bringing you a panel discussion rather than an interview in order to tackle this conversation from many different angles. Kathy Cohen is a professor of political science at the university. Her work focuses on the African-American experience in politics. John Rappaport is an assistant professor of law at the university. He studies policing and police misconduct. And Reuben Jonathan Miller is an assistant professor at the University School of Social Service Administration. He studies how mass incarceration impacts communities. I started by asking Dr. Miller to lay out the key points of social and political context to understand the movement that we're seeing today. You know, there was a recent study came out last year that showed something like one in 1,000 Black men will be killed by police over their lifetime, um, which is just striking. So, so, so death by the hands of police is a leading cause of death for Black men. And then uh, there are other studies that find that one in two black women, for example, is connected to somebody who's currently in jail or prison. And so if we think about the the, the broader context, on the one hand of police violence and the regularity in which black boys and men, black women interact with the criminal justice system, the landscape is, is haunting. So much so that political scientists are writing about how kind of modal contact with the criminal justice system shapes uh, the black experience of American democracy. This is a really provocative paper that's called The Police Are Our Government, in fact. You know, so 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 so, so the question becomes what does it mean? What does it mean for the police stop, the arrest, which often ends in violence and death, to be the main way that black people interact with the state. I think it's telling about a broader set of social conditions where black people are on the bottom. Um, and so and so it's not just the criminal justice um, system, though. Like these systems bleed over. Mm-hmm. Unemployment rates are always twice or worse uh, for black people. If we look at deaths from COVID-19, we see that black people are, are disproportionately not only contracting the virus, but disproportionately dying um, from COVID-19. And all manner of communicable diseases pass through jails and prisons first and overwhelmingly affect uh, uh, black people. So, so, so the health and, and, and sort of social infrastructure is deadly for black folks in this country. Right. John or Kathy, do you have anything to add into some of the comments that Ruben just made? I'll add a couple more. I mean, I thought Ruben was right on point, as Ruben always is. But <laughs> um, as as someone who studies young people, I think in terms of generations and generational exposure. So I think we have a generation of young people who have seen up close the limits of electoral politics, mm-hmm. right? They've seen the election of black mayors. They've seen the election of the first black president. And they've also seen that their lives have not changed. And in many ways, as Ruben detailed, their encounters with the state are violent. They're oppressive. And they don't necessarily believe, in fact, that the electoral arena has a kind of upside that will substantially change their lives or change their communities. We also have a generation that has witnessed the the possibility of protests, right? So these are young people who saw the immigrant right marches in 2005, 2006. These are young people who saw Occupy in 2011. And these are young people who have kind of benefited from the infrastructure built by the movement for black lives since 2013. So all they can rely on at this moment is themselves, their communities, and taking to the streets. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Hmm. John, what would you add into this? I agree with those who have asserted that a lot of what we're seeing is, you know, symptomatic, right? It's symptomatic of broader uh, societal failures, governmental failures that don't appear on the surface to have anything to do with policing or criminal justice, but they're decades and decades in the making and have brought us to this point. 
um, where we have a racialized caste system in this country. We have a police force that is tasked with preserving order. A lot of times what that means is preserving uh, the order of that, of that caste system. So I think huh. it's, it is very important to you know, trace this all back to the, the broader, it's the health care, it's the education, it's everything else that has created these conditions that are now coming to a head you know, in the protests that we're seeing and in the way that the police are interacting with citizens. So it begs this question in some ways of, of the why now. And, and, and Kathy, I know that, that you certainly studied the AIDS epidemic and how it impacted African-American communities during that time. And there was a protest movement that came in around that. Are there similarities to that period and to now that help continue to answer that why now question? There are and there aren't. So okay. <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to unpack it. If we think about COVID, the comparisons and you know, I've said it, it was pretty amazing to see a country shut down over what was thought to be a health crisis. It was more than a health crisis. Truly. When in fact, Truly. you know, when we think about HIV and AIDS, you couldn't get the president to actually even say the words AIDS, right? So it is strikingly different. But there are also some deep, deep similarities. I think it reminds us of who is expendable, at both of these moments, right? When people who were using injection drugs, who were primarily poor and black people, presented at, ho- at, at hospitals in emergency rooms with the same thing that would come to be understood as AIDS, that wasn't seen as a medical crisis. Why? Because those people weren't understood to be full human beings. They mm. weren't understood to be healthy human beings. So if we don't understand them to be healthy, we can't understand when they are, in fact, sick. Right. It was only when white men, largely white gay men who had insurance, who went to private doctors who could say, oh, my goodness, you used to be healthy and now you're sick, that we could understand that there was something Mm. going on. Right. That that was called HIV uh, that would become HIV and AIDS. If we think about COVID, right, when COVID was existing and it clearly did in communities of color, devastating those communities, I don't think we understood the kind of impact of COVID. Right. We had the mayor of Chicago saying she was shocked, right, that about the devastation in communities of color. I think because oftentimes we we are not paying attention, right, to the systemic nature of racism that, of course, would reproduce COVID in communities of color at much higher rates. So what did we learn? We learned that, in fact, communities of color have always suffered. They've always been disproportionately impacted And the ways in which they can amplify their voices are traditionally not through the institutions and the levers of what something we call democracy. It is only when, in fact, they take to the street, only when they threaten, right, the privilege and the security of other human beings and other communities that we take their voices seriously and their suffering seriously. The the ways in which people are demeaned for, for example, looting or burning is in part the only way we can get people to pay attention to those communities and to recognize what is being replicated and reproduced as sickness in those communities. So I want to echo something that that Kathy said, seeing the group as deserving of the consequence. So, so you've got young LGBTQ people of color who are showing up in the emergency room, who are exhibiting signs of, of a disease that people think they got from some stigmatized behavior, sex, and drug use, like th- th- this is this is the understanding of this group, and in this in, in a very similar way, the incidence of police killings it has been with us and has been really the the impetus for so many other protest movements. Almost every other black protest movement um, that that we've seen in, in 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 history, but police killings are often always dismissed because there's a presumption of guilt on behalf on, uh, of black people. Black people have been divorced from any presumption of innocence, and I and I don't mean in in a legal sense. I mean, you know, black babies are not seen as innocent. You know, black children are not seen as innocent. But we've got video now. Right. We've got video as a form of self-defense. We've got we've got video. We've got black people who stop their cars and whip out their video cameras every time a black person stopped in the street. And we've got nearly nine minutes of video. And and we've got the blatant disregard for the human life caught on camera, Mm -hmm. different from Laquan McDonald, say, uh, that that the video was hidden for a year. But the blatant disregard for the life, the face of that officer, um, I I think that really makes a difference. 
Got it. Got it. I, I want to continue on this comment about police. And, and John, I wonder if I can direct this question to you. A lot of your research looks at collective bargaining. And right now, there's a lot of discussions about police unions. And I wonder if you can kick us off going down this path and talking about what is happening in this area? What's the concern? And is it something can, that can be dismantled and a new path found forward? If you follow stories about policing and crime, you it doesn't take long before you you come across some absolutely abhorrent comments from the, you know the president of some union following the tapes coming out. So you see this stuff and you think this is not healthy, mm-hmm. right? This is this is not helping. But at the same time, there was no research that could tie this this awful rhetoric to behavior on the ground. I recently wrote a paper with a couple of colleagues from the law school um, where we were able to identify a a natural experiment that let us measure, actually, the effects of collective bargaining rights on police behavior. And it uses a Florida Supreme Court decision that gave sheriff's deputies the right to bargain collectively for the first time in 2003. And we look at their behavior before and after they had the right to bargain collectively and compare it to the behavior of municipal police officers whose rights did not change when this decision was issued. And we find that when you give sheriff's deputies collective bargaining rights, it led to a 40% increase in incidents of violent misconduct. Mm. When I think about the big picture effect of police unions, I think about it at three levels. Um, The highest level is is electoral impact. So police unions are organized groups of people who collect money and donate it to political campaigns, uh, sometimes large amounts of money. And they uh, endorse candidates. And there are some areas where those contributions and that endorsement can really make a difference in electoral politics. And they tend to unsurprisingly favor sort of more conservative, more so-called law and order candidates. The next level down is is at the policy level. So if you're the mayor of a, of a big city and you want to change your use of force policy or you want to make data more transparent about police officers' disciplinary history, you're going to have to get that through the union and the union's going to oppose it. And they always, always oppose it. And before they were opposing these things, they were opposing affirmative action in hiring. They were opposing letting women into the police. They were opposing anything that I think a lot of us would call progress. So it's hard to get policy changes through um, because of the union resistance. And then at the most granular level, and I think maybe the most important level, the unions have been incredibly successful and bargaining for contracts that make it extremely difficult to hold officers accountable. And they do this by bargaining for an array of procedural protections that kick in when an officer is being investigated for misconduct. I see. Um, And they contain rights like you can't question or interrogate the officer for the first 48 hours after the incident. And before you question him, you have to give him witness statements from all the other witnesses that you talk to. You have to give him all the camera footage And so a cynic would look at this and say, boy, it seems like you're just setting him up. You're showing him all the evidence and saying, make up a story that is defensible and fits all this evidence, right? And these are are, are rights that we would never dream of giving anyone accused of a crime because it just makes it too easy to, to, to get out of things, right? And then even if you do succeed in sustaining a charge against an officer and maybe firing that officer, there are really strong back end procedural protections, rights of appeal. Um, You take your case to a labor arbitrator. And there's not a lot of good academic evidence on this, but some really good journalistic investigation. Uh, I saw one recent study uh, using Minnesota arbitration decisions over the last five years said that 50% of all the officers who had been fired uh, had been reinstated by labor arbitrators. And so it's incredibly difficult to hold them accountable. So we think this is, you know, uh, my, my co-authors and I think this is a real problem. I'm, I'm very gratified and excited to see that um, people are starting to pay attention to this. And I think that this is a, a major impediment to so many of the other things that we want to do. People have lots of good ideas and we have lots of knowledge about how to make changes. And usually the answer is, oh, the union will never let that through. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that's got to go. So, so, so along with this concept of unionization, we are now getting an increased number of requests to either defund or abolish the police. And I wonder if I could, Kathy or Ruben, maybe have either one of you weigh in on where is this coming from? You know, people are expressing their feelings about this in a lot of different ways, but where is this concept coming from? 
and and what's the likelihood of it, it, it progressing in any which way? Well, I, I mean, I, I'll I'll just jump in, and then Ruben can follow up and clean up. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's come is coming out of out of lived experience, right? It comes out of what happens when you interact with a failed institution. In many ways, people would say that we have asked, or, or at least it's been dictated to police, that they will try to provide many different services for which they are clearly not prepared. If there's a mental health issue, right, we send a police officer. And we send a police officer often with a gun, thinking that somehow the presence of a firearm uh, attached usually to probably a white man who is not a part of that community is supposed to de-escalate the situation when in fact it often escalates the situation. If we're thinking about something like domestic violence, again, oftentimes an approach has been to, to criminalize the encounter as opposed to thinking about what in fact we can do as a, as a successful intervention. Even around issues of violence, we know that programs like Ceasefire and others that are really thinking about de-escalation in terms of violence often are more effective than trying to send out a police officer. And so I think part of the defund the police is just about the ineffectiveness of police, right, in communities. The second part is the kind of way in which a police budget absorbs so much of the air and the possibility for what might be productive in those same communities. So part of, I think, what has happened is that much of the media has really missed the demands that were coming out of the movement for Black Lives, for example. It was disinvest, invest, right? It was disinvest in the criminalization of Black communities, disinvest in the expansion of police departments, disinvest in officers in schools, and take that money and invest in those same communities, provide for health care clinics, provide for indiv individuals who can help with domestic violence, provide for housing for people who are homeless, right? I mean, it, it is a, a complete model. And unfortunately, I think the media has kind of landed on something that they believe is controversial without taking the whole idea, the whole demand uh, into uh, consideration. By latching on to this idea of defund, you mean? Yes, yes. So they're saying defund, okay. yes. But the, the other critical piece here is invest invest in communities yes. where there has been no investment. I think that's absolutely right. And, and I, I think it, it comes out of an abolitionist critique of how policing works. Police and prison abolition is, 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 is really misunderstood. There's a presumption that there's no mechanism for public safety, that, that, that what would be produced is a kind of vacuum. But really, the abolitionist uh, critique is to, is to reimagine our social systems in such a way that the problems that we're trying to address actually get addressed. Hence, investing in uh, the kinds of infrastructure that's been systematically gutted since about 1965. So, so we're watching and you're seeing Minneapolis saying that they're going to do a complete restructuring, right? You've got L.A. and New York City saying they're going to make cuts. Does that give you, John, any sense of optimism? It's early. I don't know what these things really mean. I, you know, I, I know that the city council in Minneapolis said we're going to dismantle, disband the police department. But then I saw the police chief uh, in Minneapolis give a press conference where it sounded like, you know, he hadn't gotten that memo. Uh, <laughs> and he was talking about, the, you know, the reforms that they were going to undertake, uh, you know, reduce the police budget in L.A. You know, well, what I've, what I've heard the accounts I've read is that, well, it's really more he's not going to expand the police force mm. um, rather than trim it back. So I think it's early to say. You know, a lot of people are talking about Camden as an example of a police department that has been disbanded and sort of reformed. Can, um, can you explain how, what they did, John? Yeah, so they were trapped in one of these collective bargaining agreements that made it you know, really hard to hold officers accountable. The, the police department was basically a disaster. Hmm. And you know, Camden said, look, this is such a disaster. We're not going to get to where we need to be by making incremental changes. And so they just dismantled the police department. They said, but we're shutting down our police department. That sort of cancels the collective bargaining agreement. And now we're going to reform a, a new public safety agency. It's going to be organized at the county level. Camden police officers are allowed to come interview for jobs uh, at the new county level agency, but we get to choose who we hire and, and who we don't, right? So presumably what, you know, what they tried to do is hire the good apples and, and, and not the bad apples. And, you know, I, 
I'm, I'm not going to stake my reputation on it because I think we don't know enough about Camden. But um, the early signs are good in, in terms of the, the way that it has transformed the relationship between the police and the community. I know enough now to know that all sorts of bad things are going to happen in Camden. And so, you know, no one should say that this is utopia here, but it, it does look like a market improvement. And so I think a lot of people have that in mind as a, as a potential model. I can see Kathy wants to jump in here. I do, because I want to jump in on this point of, is it hopeful? And I, I totally hear everything you said, John. And But I think none of us thought we would have a national discussion about defund the police at this moment. So I think, in fact, it is hopeful. Now, it doesn't mean that, in fact, what will be instituted will, you know, be what we want. But the idea that young people, young black people putting their bodies on the line can change the national discussion absent of the intervention of a president or even kind of significant political individuals, right, to, to change the discussion so that, in fact, we might reimagine what public safety looks like that isn't centered on a policy of policing, I think is amazing. <laughs> and I think mm. it should give us tremendous hope for what is possible in terms of kind of the radical policies, the radical dreams, and, and just the kind of radical politics of young people, in particular young black people at this moment. Right. Ruben, anything you'd, you'd want to put into there? No. No? Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good sign when it's like you've said it all. All right. Well, I, I, let, me, let me move into a different area, if I can, Kathy, because you brought this up at the beginning of our conversations about our current political environment and what that represents and why that is contributing to it at this point. And, and I wonder if, if you could expand a little bit, maybe articulate what is it that's particularly challenging about the current political environment and what needs to change if we're going to address some of the problems that we've been talking about? Oh, boy, that's a big question. Um, what's problematic about the current political environment? Um, and, and we only have we only have 12 hours, so <laughs> I know, fit, I was, fit, I was fit like, it in there where, if you can. Where do you start? Well, let, let, let me start with kind of, again, the data and the research. You know, we do this bi-monthly survey of, of young adults, and it is very clear to them that many of the political institutions that we think of as central to democracy – are failing to them, whether it is the Congress, clearly the presidency, even the media, right? They have very little faith in, in those institutions. When we ask a question about should there be a third party, more than two-thirds of young adults say absolutely, yes, there should be at least a third party. So confidence in terms of leadership is one of the problems. Now, what has been, I think, interesting at this moment is we often are thinking about the kind of political landscape from the federal perspective. We have seen the complete absence uh, of leadership there. But in many of the cities in which we've seen uprisings, whether it is uh, Atlanta or Chicago or D.C., we actually see black women as mayors. And there is an interesting, I think, interaction between both them representing uh, governance, but also being able to articulate their position of governance from being black women, from having the experiences that Ruben started us with of having uh, people in their lives, whether it's men or women or folks who are non-binary, non who have interacted with the criminal justice system, who have been incarcerated, right, who understand the difficulties and the dangers of policing, that has kind of opened up a different type of space for the possibility not of young people saying, I believe in elections, but at least understanding that the electoral arena is part of what they have to focus in on. But they also are recognizing that they can, in fact, shape the discourse on their own outside and circumvent those institutions. They can dictate what the agenda will be by taking to the street. Mm -hmm. They can demand justice for George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or the people in their neighborhoods by showing up day after day after day in, in the streets. And, and just, to, just to add to that, I'm thinking about a text that I got from a, a group of young activists uh, during the last election cycle. And it was a flyer with judges circled. He's a op 
the, the, the flyer said, and the judge was circled who was consistently ruling against um, the, the interests of these young activists. What that said to me in that moment and what that says to me now is that the, the activists are paying attention to local politics, which to me is fantastic. I feel like there's been an overwhelming sort of distraction at the federal level, um, especially during the Obama administration. And the second thing, are, are the kinds of things that we're discussing. I, you know, uh, Kathy mentioned that we're discussing uh, defunding the police, you know, discussions about anti-Black racism, about what it means to be a, quote, ally, about, about, about how to address change in a broader level, and about the role of violence. This, to me, is the place we need to be, um, where, we, where we do away with categories of innocence and guilt, not all together, because I think that matters. You know, people cause harm. Things need to happen. Um, but there's been a, a valuing of, of, of innocence and a valuing of clean, neat, uh, perfect lines that I feel like is beginning to be done away with that I think opens a new set of possibilities for political action, political mobilization and just for, for, for new ways to experience everyday life. And I want to keep this going, um, Ruben, if I can with you. Because I, I know you've done some some research around an area that you call moral worlds. Yeah. Um, and, and I wonder if you can explain a little bit what you mean by moral worlds and what are the moral worlds of, of this current environment? Yeah. So so it, I'm, I'm, I started a project where I'm following people who have been accused of crimes of violence, murder, rape, people we, 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 we tend to fear and loathe. And I'm very interested um, in the way that the way that they're valued in kind of the social world that they that they navigate. I'm interested in the kinds of messages that are relayed about violent people and, and, and problems of violence. And I'm and I'm and I'm interested in the extent to which they interpret and, and internalize um, these statements about who they are and what they've done. And I'm also interested in so the, the, the relative reasons why people make decisions. So 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 why become a drug robber and not say a dope dealer? Why become, you know, a, a, a gun runner and not say, you know, I don't know, name your name, your other um, uh, position that you could take up and, and, and say a quote illicit economy. I think right now the moral landscape is changing, and and this is part and parcel of, of, of sort of uh, this this m my last set of comments. I think we've uh -huh. been fixated with questions of innocence and guilt, uh, which is why there was so little progress. Uh, you know, when the AIDS epidemic, for example, first happened. You know, what are the things that you did that brought on this thing that brought this thing onto yourself? And I think there's a full out rejection of of respectability politics that that was ushered in by the black the, the movement for Black Lives, and and, and I. Think Think that's changing the, the moral landscape in the values that we assign to people and their actions and our ability to allow for whether or not you, you've engaged in some process of redemption for people to be full participants in, say, a human community. So, so, so when you ask me, like, what's the what's the landscape right now? I think the landscape is changing. The politics of old are, 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 are beginning to be eroded slowly. And, and the proof of that for me are the role that formerly incarcerated activists are playing in every social movement that we're seeing right now. John, you're nodding your head on that. What are, what are your thoughts? You no, know, especially that last point. Before I was an academic, I was a public defender and you know, came to know a lot of people who had uh, been convicted of, of a lot of crimes, including a lot of murders. And it was, these really are just, they're just people too. You know, I, I think I'm the curmudgeon in this group, so may, I hadn't noticed this, but you know, I think Ruben's exactly right. You're too right young that, to be a curmudgeon, John. <laughs> that Ruben's exactly right that, 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 that the involvement of, of um, formerly incarcerated people, put, putting them at, not just involved, not just in the crowd, but out in front. And that this is, you know, this is a fact about my life, but this doesn't define me. And this doesn't allow you to marginalize my views mm. uh, and my voice. And of course, this, you know, makes me think on a, on a legal level of, you know, the um, voting rights issues that have been going on in Florida right now with reenfranchising uh, and then the fight against the reenfranchisement of people who have been convicted of crimes. But I, I do, I, I agree with Ruben that that's really a significant development and that that's a healthy sign, I think, for our society if we can get to a place where people really can be reintegrated and that you can commit a crime, even a violent crime, you can serve time if that's, if that's how our society needs to deal with it. And then you can reenter and you're not sort of permanently uh, marginalized because of that. I think that's significant. Mm -hmm. 
Big Brains is supported by the Harris School of Public Policy Evening Master's Program at the University of Chicago. Looking to accelerate your social impact? Discover the part-time UChicago policy degree and learn how to use evidence-based decision-making to lead measurable change in any sector. Work alongside top UChicago faculty to put policy into action using your data science and analytical toolkit. Visit harris.uchicago.edu slash evening program. Now, all three of you are professors at the University of Chicago. How do you see this conversation that we're having playing out on campus um, with your students? Well, it's such an unusual time to have conversations at all, right? I mean, I haven't seen my students in, in the flesh um, in quite a long time. And though I see them online, the conversations are different from what they used to be. I mean, there is, you know, we can we can sense the change in our students. It's it's so rapid from one year to the next. The the understandings and the expectations that students bring in, um, especially to the study of law, right? Because law, you, you show up at law school and you are taught, uh, especially in the first year of legal education, you are taught, you know, the way things have always been done. Um, and you read a lot of old stuff and it's all about sort of Burkean, you know, slow change, incremental in the last couple years, you know, it seems like the first year students have become more impatient with that. And, and they say, well, you know, why do it that way? And we're like, well, because lots of really smart people before us have, you know, thought about it and they decided to do it this way. And, and they just don't accept that. Um, and then more, con- you know, more concretely and more specifically, we've had conversations about, you know, how to handle protests at the law school. There have been protests that get to a point mm-hmm. where law school staff feel like they're not sure they can handle it. Who do you call? And right now in our society, you, you call the police. And if the police come, they're going to be bearing arms, right? And, this, and the students are pushing back on that hard. And they're frankly, they're demanding something that doesn't exist, which is, you know, you, you should call somebody who's going to show up, but they're not going to be armed and they're going to be able to help the situation. And, we're, and, you know, our reaction is, well, that's not a bad idea. In fact, that's a pretty good idea, but we don't exactly know how to pull it off right now. I mean, you know, literally we're sitting here like, well, can we, can we tell the police to leave their gun at the door? Like, can mm-hmm. we leave it in the car? Like, how does this work? And this just all circles back to stuff we've been talking about this whole time about – we have such a deficiency in, in non-police public safety services. We have no other options sometimes. And so the students are really pushing us in a very concrete way to think about this and to, to come up with something better, to come up with something different. I think when we think about our students, there is a way in which that question could be read as, look at all that that's happening out in the world. How will you talk about that with your students? And I want to say that Look at all that's happening at the university, right? You can't talk about universities these days without recognizing that I think it's 92% of colleges and universities have their own police force. And so Uh I think there now has to be a conversation on campus about what does it mean to invest in policing through our campus police, right? What does it mean to study and reimagine what safety looks like independent or without the idea of policing as it's currently practiced? What is the role of the university in reproducing, right, systemic racism? There is a way in which many of us who have a responsibility to our students and to to the communities from which we come, black communities, to the South Side, which is right there, right at the door and the gates of the university, that we have to understand the role of the university in hoarding power, Supporting resources, right, and labor for its benefit, in many ways, you know, disinvesting in those same communities. So now that we have a framework, what does it mean to disinvest in policing and invest in those communities, to invest in those students, right, to invest in employment? And I, I am sure the university would say they're already doing some of that, but I think we would want to begin to think about systemically. What does that look like? And what is a shift in power at the university where those issues are a priority? What does that look like? 
Ruben, anything to add into this? Yeah, I mean, just that our students are certainly pushing us to think in these ways. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what's happening, for example, at the at the at the Posen Center for Human Rights, you know, the mass incarceration working group. It is among the most popular things that I've seen. Um, there was a we, there was a, a, a one of those midnight philosophy talks on policing. Yes. It was packed. Hundreds of people, uh, you know, just, just very powerful. You know, uh, so our students are for are pushing us, hopefully forcing us uh, to have conversations about broad based social change. Um, at the university, and certainly about the university's role in perpetuating um, these systemic forms of violence. It's it's easy to listen to this conversation saying we've got some uh, huge challenges in front of us, and and you guys have done a wonderful job articulating what some of those things are. Is there anything, starting with you, John, that that as you think about this? Uh, and maybe it's even thinking about this energy with some of our students and young people as a whole that that is giving you a sense of hope. Yeah, I guess two things. I mean, one is I'd start where where Ruben just ended and where the last exchanges just ended, which is with the students. I mean, the main reason I, I love being a professor and why I wanted to be a professor rather than you know a practicing attorney, which is what I was before, um, is this opportunity to work with people who, who never age, right? They're always, always new 22, 23 year olds coming in and bringing their new uh, ideas in and, and they're hopeful. And, and, you know, especially if you work in the legal world for long enough and you see how hard it is to make change, you get, you get worn down and you get a certain degree of pessimism uh, about the pace of change. And the students really, uh, I think, energize us and push us. Mm -hmm. And so um, just every year, the influx of students and hearing from the students does make me hopeful. And that's, you know, I think overlaps with the population that we're seeing out um, in the protests right now. And then another th another thing is just that this is a, a really special moment. And there are things that are on the table now um, that weren't on the table a couple weeks ago um, in terms of policy changes, legal changes, cultural changes. We can, you know, debate all night about whether they're going to be significant enough changes or whether they're going to backfire or all these things. But the, the, the point is, you know, the, the decision space is, is huge right now. And things like, you know, people have been talking about ending qualified immunity for decades. And it, it actually looks like it could happen, you know. And, and this, all these other things that we've been writing about for decades, you know, a lot of them could happen right now. And that's really, really exciting. Mm. Kathy? I mean, I, I would agree with John. I mean, this is an incredible moment, and I, I want to say expanding moment, right? I don't think it's ending anytime soon. We have a an election coming up in November. I think even the discussion about voter suppression in ways that we haven't seen. I.e. Georgia, right? Of, that's right. Well, in Georgia and across the country. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> the possibility of vote by mail, the question of where does a voting strategy fit into a protest strategy, Right. I think all of these things are being discussed uh, in a serious way, and not just by, uh, to, to John's point, not just by a small group of people, right, on Twitter, or not just by the left, if we want to call them that, but really by a larger public who is trying to figure out uh, what the hell just happened and why did it happen, right? We start with this question, how did, how did this happen? And I think we are watching a country struggle with its history of systemic racism and white supremacy in a way that I haven't seen in my lifetime. So I, you know, I, I don't think we know where this ends, but I do always want to say there has to be some gratitude to young people who have been organizing without a lot of wins, who have built infrastructure in communities, who have talked to young people and engaged in political education, and who are now kind of helping to mobilize people into the streets to demand attention and set an agenda. And I think however it ends, and I don't, I don't know if I'd say in, it really speaks to the possibility of what political participation and democracy should look mm -hmm. like. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that makes me hopeful. Ruben, let's wrap this question up with you. <laughs> Uh, so, so two things, uh, uh, well, two groups of people make me very hopeful. So one is the role that formerly incarcerated activists are playing uh, in, in, in the broader civic landscape. I think that 
uh, that people are seizing the moment and they're seizing opportunities to not just participate in in movements, uh, as, as as John and Kathy have, have pointed out, but to lead them. And, and that, to me, says a lot. It, it, it just speaks volumes. And then the second, you know, I'm going to cheat and say the kids, the kids make me hopeful. And, and maybe maybe calling them kids is, is, is pejorative and I don't mean to. But let, <laughs> let me say let me say the, 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 the youth and young adults, I think the level of, 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 of civic education that participating in a movement provides is high. And I think the level of civic education and civic action right now is high. Um, you know, we, we've just had protests, sustained protest movements across 50 states. Every right. state participated. This is this is new. This We have not seen this uh, uh, before. And, 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 and I think, um, you know, watching young people, young adults specifically, uh, find new ways to resist uh, systemic oppression and violence, whether that be through, uh, you know, uh, songs and memes, uh, 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 dancing in the street or breaking a car window or, or burning a police car or, or, or all these different expressions of resistance. G- give me hope. Give me real hope. Big Brains is a production of the UChicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, with assistance from Alyssa Eads. Thanks for listening. Listening.